How's everybody doing? Great to be learning with you on a Tuesday. Yom Shlishi. Let's light up the darkness. Who's in the house on a Tuesday? Michael in Gilbert, Arizona. Welcome. Paul in the great Northwest. Bella in Florida. Sharon in New Jersey. Joseph in Massachusetts. Frank in San Pedro. Guy in Ohio. Bill in mid-Missouri. Marjorie in Georgia. Welcome, everybody. Continuing our discussion of Mishnah number one here in chapter four. Our daf is Mem Zion, page 47. Uh, we're picking that up, uh, yeah, you know, about halfway down the page. About halfway down the page on 47a. And in this Mishnah, we're continuing to explore the principle of when is a transaction finalized? Uh, if, if something is being purchased for money, it's not when the money changes hands. It's when uh, the seller, well, when the buyer takes formal acquisition of the uh, product, right? So, or the commodity that is being sold. So, whether or not the money has changed hands yet when due to it they made a deal and he takes the commodity the thing being sold then the deal is final if he hasn't paid the money yet he has to hand over the money uh but he cannot cancel the sale he cannot renege on the sale uh when money's being traded for money uh like trading you know one national currency for another one of the currencies is going to be considered the commodity the other is going to be considered the currency uh, and there's been a bunch of principles that flow out of this including when do we say that something has been formally acquired right it's simple when it's a thing that's being bought that can be picked up uh, or an animal is being sold and it can be pulled uh, then we say that the buyer has taken formal acquisition what if one commodity one product one piece of produce one non-monetary thing uh, is being traded for another, then we generally would say that that is exchange. And generally speaking, when one of the parties uh, takes makes acquisition uh, of the thing that's being traded, th then the other one automatically acquires what he's receiving, even if he hasn't received it yet, meaning the deal has been finalized and the parties cannot renege on it. Okay. Above, the Gemara mentioned a form of exchange in which there are not two items of equal value being traded, but rather one person attempts to transfer possession of his item to the buyer by means of a symbolic exchange involving, for example, a cloth. Right. And so we saw that when you're, you know, taking at when you're purchasing a field, I mean, obviously you can't pick up the field. You can't pull the field. So usually what we'll say is they'll use uh, the um, <clears throat> the method of acquisition known, known as exchange uh, and where what's being exchanged is something symbolic so that you can say that the buyer of the field took possession of the field. What did he do? He handed a handkerchief to the seller. Uh, that would be symbolic exchange, but it's it, it's symbolic, but it's an important matter because from that moment on, the field is understood to belong to the purchaser, right? Uh, so with regard to that symbolic transaction, the Gemara asks, with what vessel does one acquire the item in question, i.e., whose vessel? is used in order to affect this symbolic transaction, right? So you are selling me a field, right? I'm going to either pay you, you know, I don't know, $1,000, or I'm going to owe you $1,000, or maybe we'll have an installment plan for me to pay you the $1,000. But at the moment that I am taking possession of the field, uh, so I'm going to hand you a handkerchief. Now, what if I don't have a handkerchief in my pocket? Can you provide the handkerchief and just hand it to me so that I can give it to you to be the symbolic exchange? Generally, no, right? I have to bring uh, the item of symbolic exchange, as we shall see. Rav says, one affects the transaction with the vessels of the one acquiring the item, right? The purchaser. 
who affects the transaction by giving the vessels to the owner of the item that is being sold. And the moment that the owner pulls the vessel, like I give you the handkerchief and you take it from me, so the moment that the owner pulls the vessel into his possession, the transaction is complete and ownership of the property in question has been transferred to the other party. Now, Rav explains that the one acquiring the item is amenable to having the one who is transferring ownership of the item acquire his vessel so that he will resolve to transfer ownership to him. And Levy says, one affects the transaction by having the one acquiring the item pull the vessels of the one transferring ownership, as we seek to explain below. So Levy is saying the opposite, that I'm acquiring a field from you, so I'm going to give you a handkerchief for the formal acquisition. Levy would say, well, no, you're selling me a field. I'm giving you a bunch of money. So we can say that the transfer of the field is formalized when you give me a handkerchief, as if that's symbolizing you uh, transferring the field to my possession. So you're giving me the handkerchief rather than I'm symbolically exchanging the handkerchief for the field. Uh, this is going to be the minority view. Now, Rav Huna from Discarta said to Rava, but according to Levi, who says that one affects the transaction with the vessels of the one transferring ownership, there is a difficulty in a case where one acquires land by means of symbolic exchange, where the item used is a cloak. It turns out that he is acquiring land by means of a cloak. Well, if so, this is a case of property that is guaranteed, i.e. land, and it is acquired with movable property that is not guaranteed by means of a transaction performed on the non-guaranteed property, the movable property. Guaranteed property means land. And we learned the opposite in the mission, attracted Kedushin 26a, property that is not guaranteed is acquired with property that is guaranteed, i.e. land, by means of a transaction performed on the latter. In other words, if you want to sell land and movable goods, you can do that in one transaction, but the movable goods flow along with the land, not the land flows along with the movable goods. And that's why that, and that, that is offered as a counter proof to the Levy's idea that if I'm buying a field from you and we're going to do symbolic exchange for the transfer of ownership, that you would give me a handkerchief or a cloak. Rather, I need to give you something in exchange for you giving me the land. Now, uh, right, so Rava said to him, if Levy, whose opinion you questioned, were here, he would take out rods of fire before you and flog you <coughs> for your unwarranted question. Do you maintain that Levy said that at the moment he transfers ownership of the cloak, he transfers ownership of the land to him? This is not the case. Rather, in exchange for that pleasure that the owner of the item experiences from the fact that the one acquiring the cloak accepted it from him, he resolves to transfer ownership to him. And this is unlike the acquisition of movable items by means of a transaction of land where both are acquired simultaneously. Here, the transfer of ownership of the cloak affects the subsequent transfer of ownership of the land, right? So the, 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 the simpler way, which became the law, is, okay, now it's time for you to transfer the land to me. I give you a handkerchief, you give me the land, symbolic exchange. What Levy was saying, according to Rava, uh, is that, no, you're going to give me the handkerchief. And what I'm giving you is the pleasure uh, of you, that you get the pleasure of giving me the handkerchief. And in exchange for that, that you are giving me the land, right? Uh, so th there is a symbolic exchange, except it's not really an item. It's an emotion for uh, the f in exchange for the field. You can see how that's complicated and why that ended not being the, the halacha. Now the Gemara comments, This dispute between Rav and Levi is parallel to a dispute between Tanaim. And the verse states, Now this was the custom in former time in Israel concerning redemption and concerning substitution to confirm all matters. A man drew off his shoe 
and gave it to his neighbor. Now we learn that, right, in the book of Ruth uh, that we read on Shavuos. Uh, remember that Ruth and Naomi come and, you know, they're very poor. Uh, and so Naomi sends Ruth to glean uh, in, um, uh, what's his name? Hi. I'm spacing on the name. I'm sure somebody will put it in the comments. Boaz. Boaz. Go glean in Boaz's field. And Boaz ends up marrying Ruth. Uh, and from that line of descendants eventually comes King David. But at any rate, uh, when they're talking about who is the heir, the natural heir to the husband that Naomi lost when she was abroad, uh, right? And Ruth is her daughter-in-law who came back to Israel with her. Uh, but they were talking about confirming legal matters of who is the legal heir and who should marry Ruth, etc. Uh, who, who should perform yibum. It was a kind of, you know, pre-Torah uh, legal yibum at that time, right? No, it's, what am I saying? It's post-Torah. It's definitely post-Torah. Uh, but it, it was a kind of yibum. Uh, it wasn't the brother, it was a, a, diff, a cousin or a nephew or whatever of this man who died. At any rate, at any rate, uh, the point being that they confirmed a legal obligation in public by giving a shoe from one person to the other. In other words, this was a symbolic transfer of an obligation performed in front of the townspeople so that everyone would witness it and remember it, right? And what they were doing was giving the shoe. And this ends up being one of the sources in the Torah, or let's say in the Bible, uh, that becomes the source for the idea of symbolic exchange, right? So here it is. Um, how does it work? Let's let's go back here, right? To now, this was the custom in former time in a former time in Israel. Concerning redemption and concerning substitution to confirm all matters, a man drew off his shoe and gave it to his neighbor. Ruth 4, 7. So the verse is interpreted, redemption, that is a sale. And likewise it says, neither shall be sold nor shall be redeemed. Leviticus 27, 28. Substitution, that is the transaction of exchange. And likewise it says, he may neither exchange it nor substitute it in Leviticus 27.10. In other words, they're looking at the way language is used in the Torah uh, to help us interpret a verse that's given uh, you know, in Ruth, one of the later books, or one of the writings, uh, in a later part in the Bible, to, but to help us understand that that verse in Ruth is teaching us about how we symbolically finalize different kinds of transactions, uh, including exchange and sale. So with regard to the phrase, to confirm all matters, a man drew off his shoe and gave it to his neighbor, the Barisa asks, who gave the shoe to whom? So Boaz gave his shoe to the Redeemer, the closest relative of Elimelech, who had the right of first refusal to the land that Naomi, Elimelech's widow, was planning to sell. And the Redeemer was transferring that right to the land to Boaz, who was acquiring it by means of his shoe. So Rabbi Yehuda says the Redeemer gave his shoe to Boaz. So the dispute between Rav and Levi is parallel to the dispute between the first Tana and Rabbi Yehuda, right? When we're saying we're going to finalize the exchange of I'm purchasing a field from you. At what point do I actually take possession of the field? It's not when I give you the money because we don't finalize deals when the money changes hands. It's when the field changes hands. How does a field change hands? Is it that you give me a handkerchief? I'm purchasing the field. You give me the handkerchief? No, that was the minority view. I give you a handkerchief. That's a symbolic exchange. And that's when we say it's finalized. And we're learning that out from the view that said uh, in the story of Boaz making a deal with the Redeemer, uh, presumably Boaz gave the shoe and received that right to redeem the land of Elimelech. New subject. It was taught one can acquire property through a symbolic exchange by using a vessel, even if it does not have the value of one peruta, right? This handkerchief that I'm going to give you in exchange for your field that's worth a million dollars. Does the handkerchief, which is purely symbolic, but even though it's only being used to finalize this transfer of ownership through a symbolic exchange, 
is there some minimum requirement of what the handkerchief is? Right? Does it have to be worth at least one peruta, which was the smallest denomination of coin there was? Or can it be worth even less than one peruta? Uh, right? So it was taught one can acquire property through a symbolic exchange by using a vessel, even if it does not have the value of one peruta. Rav Nachman said the sages taught that this symbolic exchange can be effected only by using a vessel, but not by using produce, i.e. any item other than a vessel. So Rav Sheshis says it can be affected even by using produce. And the Gemara explains what is the reason for the opinion of Rav Nachman. And the verse states his shoe uh, from Ruth 4.7, from which it is derived with regard to a shoe and any other item similar to a shoe, like a vessel. Yes, the symbolic exchange can be affected. With regard to any item other than a vessel, no, it cannot be affected. What is a vessel? Obviously, a vessel, uh, you know, it's a kind of far-reaching, broadly defined item. Sometimes we also will use the word utensil, right? But a shoe, a glass, a fork, or does it mean something that's a container? Here, it seems to me to be like any manufactured object uh, to the exclusion of produce, right? Not something that grew out of the ground, but something that is manufactured. What is the reason for the opinion of Rav Sheshis? The verse in Ruth states to confirm all matters from which it is derived that all items, even if they are not vessels, can affect the exchange. Yeah, I'll give you the apple when you give me the field, right? So why not use an apple for the symbolic exchange? After all, some apples are beautiful. Beautiful. You can see all of creation in an apple. Much better than some grungy old handkerchief. Seems like a better uh, item to use as a symbolic exchange. Uh, so Rav Sheshis would say, yeah, you could use anything, even things that are not vessels. Like you could use an apple. And the Gemara asks, well, according to Rav Nachman as well, isn't it written to confirm all matters? So why does Rav Nachman say it has to be a vessel? And the Gemara explains, in his opinion, that phrase, to confirm all matters, is referring to all items that can be acquired through the exchange affected by using a shoe. In other words, I can buy produce through symbolic exchange using a shoe or a handkerchief or some other manufactured object, uh, but I can't use produce as the symbolic item. Uh, the Gemara asks, and according to Rav Sheshis as well, isn't it written, his shoe? And the Gemara explains, Rav Sheshis could have said to you that from that term it is derived, just as his shoe is a complete item, so too every complete item can affect a symbolic exchange, and this would exclude half a pomegranate or half a nut. If you're gonna use some kind of produce, it has to be a whole apple or a whole pomegranate or a whole nut, but not a half piece of produce. Rav Sheshis, the son of Rav Yidi, said, in accordance with whose opinion do we write today, right, today, 1500 years ago, in documents that the transaction was effected with a vessel that is fit to acquire items with it. So Rav Shesha says, hey, it says it was symbolically exchanged for an item that is fit to acquire. So what is the minimum? What is the qualification? What is it that qualifies this item to be used in symbolic exchange? Isn't it that it's some kind of vessel? What, else, what other qualification is there? And the Gemara explains the term with a vessel serves to exclude the opinion of Rav Sheshis, who says one acquires an item through a transaction of symbolic exchange by using produce. The term that that is fit serves to exclude the opinion of Shmuel, who says one acquires an item with date pits used for cleaning and smoothing parchment. The term to acquire items, this serves to exclude the opinion of Levi, who said that the symbolic exchange is affected by means of the vessels of the one transferring ownership of the item, you giving me the handkerchief. This latter expression teaches us that the vessel is given to acquire and not to transfer ownership to the other. And with regard to the term with it, Rav Papa said it serves to exclude a coin which cannot affect a symbolic exchange. And Rav Zevid and some say Rav Ashi said it serves to exclude items from which deriving benefit is prohibited.
right? So if you're going to ask what items can be used uh, as the symbolic side of the symbolic exchange for something much more valuable, you would say it's something that belongs to the purchaser, to the one who's going to acquire uh, the expensive object. He has to be the owner of it. It doesn't come uh, from the one who is transferring away ownership of the expensive item. It has to be some kind of a vessel and not produce. Uh, it can't be something like date pits, you know, which you could say were manufactured uh, in order that they could be used to smooth down parchment. Uh, but that's too, you know, not 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 so not so much insignificant if it has a, a real purpose. But it's too trashy, right? It it it, it it's not it's not good enough, right? It's it's too grungy. Uh, that, I'm not getting the right adjective. It'll come. Uh, right. And also, uh, what are we learning? You can't use money. Obviously, money cannot be used as a symbolic exchange and it can't be some object uh, that for some other reason it is prohibited to derive benefit from it. Like if it was used in idolatry, then no Jew could ever derive benefit from it. And so you couldn't use it. Uh, as an item in symbolic exchange. Now, some say a different version of the dispute as follows. With regard to the term with insignificant, I think that's the word I was looking for, insignificant. The date pits would be too insignificant. Okay, some say a different version of the dispute as follows. With regard to the term with it, Rav Papa said this serves to exclude a coin uh, which cannot affect a symbolic exchange. And with regard to the term that is fit, Rav Zevit and some say Rav Ashi said it serves to include exclude items from which deriving benefit is prohibited, like something that was used in idolatry, a vodazara. But according to this version, a verse to exclude date pits is not necessary as they are of no significance at all. New subject, and we are on page 47b. The Gemara returns to an analysis of a passage in the Mishnah. When one party takes possession of and asimon, asimon. What does asimon mean? We're going to discuss that. When one party takes possession of an asimon, the other party acquires the minted coin. In other words, if you are using minted coins, coins, the way we understand coins, to purchase asimons, then the asimon is the commodity and the coin is the currency. Uh, and so it's when the commodity changes hands that the deal is done. If an asimon is not a coin, then it would seem obvious that it's some kind of a commodity. Why is this even worth mentioning? Answer, because an asimon bears a resemblance to minted coins, and that's why they need to discuss it. So, the Gemara asks, what is an asimon? And Rav said, it is one of the coins given as a token to gain entry into the bathhouse for which the bathers would pay later. So you can think it's like a subway token. Do people remember subway tokens? I guess now they use cards. Uh, but remember, subway tokens were like coins. They look like coins. They weren't you know, legal tender in the same way, but everyone understood what their value was. Uh, or tokens in an arcade, right? Those, those, everyone understood what their value was, even though they weren't minted by the government. So it sounds like an asimon is that kind of coin, coin-like object that's not a coin, but is treated like a coin in the sense that it has a specific value in a certain context. The Gemara raises an objection from a Baraisa. One desacralizes second tithe produce neither with an asimon nor with one of the coins given as a token to gain entry into the bathhouse. Well, this proves by inference that an asimon is not one of the coins given as tokens to enter a bathhouse. And if you would say the Tan is explaining the meaning of the term asimon, there is a difficulty with that explanation. But wasn't it taught in another Baraisa like this? One desacralizes second tithe produce with an asimon. This is the statement of Rabbi Dosa. And the rabbis who overrule Rabbi Dosa say one does not desacralize second tithe produce with an asimon. And they agree that one does not desacralize the second tithe produce by transferring its sanctity onto one of the coins given as a token to gain entry into the bathhouse. From this Baraisa, it is clear that an asimon is not a token given to gain entry into a bathhouse. So rather, Rabbi Yochanan said, what is an asimon? 
it is a blank, i.e. it is a piece of metal in the shape of a coin that was not yet imprinted. So it hasn't acquired the minted value of a coin issued by the realm. It's ready to become that, but it's not. So at this point, really all it is, is a coin shaped piece of metal that presumably has the value uh, you know, of that metal by weight, or possibly a little bit more since it's ready to be minted. <clears throat> Uh, bah, bah, bah. not yet imprinted. And Rabbi Yochanan follows his standard line of reasoning. As Rabbi Yochanan said, Rabbi Dosa and Rabbi Yishmael said the same thing. Rabbi Dosa, as we stated, said that the legal status of an asimon is that of a coin. And with regard to Rabbi Yishmael, what is his statement? It is as it is taught in Abraisa, and you shall bind up the money in your hand. Like right? talking about second tithe, which you would use to fund your eating and drinking when you go on a pilgrimage festival to Jerusalem when the temple was standing. And this serves to include any type of money that is bound in one's hand, i.e. money that has money, monetary value, right? Minted coins. And this is the statement of Rabbi Yishmael. Rabbi Akiva says it serves to include any type of money that has an imprint. And Rabbi Akiva requires a minted coin in order to desacralize second tithe produce uh, on a coin, while Rabbi Yishmael actually says that a blank can be used as well. Ah, so Rabbi Yishmael is saying, no, it doesn't have to be a minted coin, as long as it's a coin, right? So in other words, Rabbi Yishmael would allow you to desacralize uh, second uh, uh, to desacralize de de second tithe produce onto subway tokens because even though they're not coins, they're under they're coin like, right? And they have an understood value, so it would work. Rabbi Kiva would say, No, it has to be a minted coin, what we call money, and that ends that discussion. Now, the Mishnah teaches how so if back to our Mishnah when our Mishnah said, How so. Uh, and this was talking about when is a transaction finalized. That's what how so is about, not about what kind of money constitutes money. So the Mishnah taught how so. If the buyer pulled produce from the seller, but the buyer did not yet give the seller their value in coins, he cannot renege on the transaction. But if the buyer gave the seller coins, but did not yet pull, pull the produce from him, he can renege on the transaction as the transaction is not yet complete, right? Once again, when somebody's exchanging money for some kind of purchase, commodity, produce, whatever you're buying, uh, when you take possession of the purchased item, that's when the deal is finalized. If you've simply handed over the money and not yet received the produce, the deal is not finalized. We're saying that over and over again. Now we're going to get, get a little bit more into the nitty gritty of that. By Torah law, money affects acquisition. Once the, the buyer per, hands over the money, by Torah law, the deal is done. But the sages came in and issued a rabbinic decree and said, no, the deal is not yet done. By Torah law, money affects acquisition. I.e., when one pays money, he acquires the item even if he has not yet performed some other active acquisition on the produce, like pulling it, into, pulling it to him. And for what reason did the sages say that pulling acquires an item uh, and money does not? This is a rabbinic decree, lest the seller say to the buyer after receiving the money, ah, sorry, your wheat was burned in the upper story of the storehouse. If a fire breaks out or some other mishap occurs after a seller receives the money, he will not bother to save the goods in his house because they no longer belong to him and the buyer may incur a loss, right? Imagine that there was a fire in the storehouse uh, and, the and you know, half of the produce got destroyed, uh, the half that they couldn't get to because it was in the upper story. And so the seller could say, yeah, well, what you, what you bought, that was among the produce in the upper story. Sorry, we couldn't save it, right? You should have picked it up after you paid for it. To prevent the seller from saying that, we say that, the, no, the deal has not been finalized if all he did was receive the money. Uh, the buyer has not yet acquired the produce, so if it burned while it was still in the seller's possession, the seller is still liable to replace that produce and give it to the buyer because the seller has already accepted the money. The Gemara asks, ultimately, the one who ignited the fire is required to pay for the damage caused. 
and the one who purchased the movable items with money will be reimbursed for his loss. So why was there a need to issue this decree? Rather, it is a rabbinic decree lest a fire be ignited spontaneously due to circumstances beyond one's control where no one is liable to pay for the damage caused. So if you establish the purchase item in the possession of the seller, he will expend great effort, exert himself, and rescue the item uh, that belongs, that is still, you know, he's still liable for it uh, because it's still his own property. But if you do not establish the purchase item in the possession of the seller, he will not expend great effort, he will not exert himself, and he will not rescue the item. That is the opinion of Rabbi Yochanan. Reish Lakish, right, who typically disagrees with Rabbi Yochanan, uh, out of love, right, because he was his student and colleague and tremendous, tremendous close friend of Rabbi Yochanan, but he's typically the one who disagrees with him. Reish Lakish says, the act of acquisition of pulling is explicit in the Torah. And it is not merely by rabbinic decree that payment of money does not affect acquisition of movable property. It's by Torah law. It's not by rabbinic decree that the acquisition, that the, per, the, the purchase, the deal is not done until the buyer pulls the produce. It's by Torah law, says Reish Lakish. And what is the reason for the opinion of Reish Lakish? He derives it from the Torah. As the verse states, Leviticus 25, 14, and if you sell to your colleague an item that is sold or acquire from your colleague's hand, you shall not exploit his brother. And the reference is to an item that is acquired from hand to hand by means of pulling. And Rabbi Yochanan said the term from your colleague's hand is not teaching that an item can be acquired by pulling. Rather, it serves to exclude land, which is not subject to the law of exploitation because it is not physically handed over from one person to another. And the Gemara asks, and how does Reish Lakish respond to that explanation of Rabbi Yochanan? And the Gemara answers, Reish Lakish agrees that the verse serves to exclude land from the law of exploitation. But if it is so that this was its only purpose, let the verse write, and if you sell from your colleague's hand an item that is sold, you shall not exploit. Why do I need the additional phrase, or acquire? Learn from it that acquisition by Torah law is affected by means of pulling according to Reish Lakish. And the Gemara asks, and as for Rabbi Yochanan, what does he do with the phrase, or acquire? What law does he derive? The Gemara answers, he requires that phrase for that which is taught in a Baraisa. From the phrase in the verse, and if you sell to your colleague an item that is sold, you shall not exploit. I have derived only a case where the buyer was exploited. The buyer was exploited. From where is it derived that the law is the same in a case where the seller was exploited? And the verse states, or acquire, you shall not exploit, indicating that it is prohibited for the one who acquires the item to exploit the seller. Right? Remember that when you're talking about the kinds of commodities that sustain life, like bread, you know, wine, whatever, food, you know, uh, a person is only allowed to make an absolute profit about one-sixth, right? whether on the purchase side or the sale side. <clears throat> We learned in the mission that Rabbi Shimon says anyone who has the money in his possession has the advantage. It is the seller who can retract the transaction. The buyer cannot retract from the transaction. Legally, after the buyer hands over the money, we said that the deal is not done. You can renege, but not the buyer. The buyer already handed over the money. He can't get the money back. The seller can say, I'm not going to sell it to you. Here, take your money back. I'm not going to give you the item because the sale has not been finalized until the purchaser pulls the produce. But as we learn, if the seller reneges on a sale after he's already received the money and said, here, take your money back, that's considered immoral uh, and there will be a price to pay before the heavenly court for such behavior. So the Gemara asks, granted, if you say that giving money affects acquisition of movable property, movable property, it is due to that reason that the seller cannot retract from the transaction and the buyer cannot retract from the transaction. Rabbi Yochanan explained that the sage has instituted pulling to complete the transaction for the benefit of the buyer so that the seller will expend great effort and rescue the item as it is still his own property. But the seller acquires the money immediately. But if you say in general that giving money does not affect acquisition of movable, movable property, let the buyer also 
be able to renege on the transaction. And the Gemara answers, Reish Lakish could have said to you, I did not state my opinion in accordance with the opinion of Rabbi Shimon. When I stated my opinion, it was in accordance with the opinion of the rabbis. And the Gemara asks, granted, according to Reish Lakish, that is the dispute between the opinions of Rabbi Shimon and the rabbis. As Rabbi Shimon holds that money affects acquisition of the item, and the rabbis hold that only pulling the item affects its acquisition. But according to Rabbi Yochanan, what difference is there between the opinion of Rabbi Shimon and that of the rabbis? And the Gemara responds, the difference between them, from his point of view, is with regard to the statement of Rav Chista. As Rav Chista says, just as the sages instituted pulling for the sellers, likewise they instituted pulling for the buyers. Until the item is pulled, the buyer can also renege on the transaction. Rabbi Shimon does not hold in accordance with the statement of Rav Chizda, and the rabbis do hold in accordance with the statement of Rav Chizda. And we learned in the Mishnah, but the sages said, he who exacted payment from the people of the generation of the flood and from the generation of the dispersion will in the future exact payment from whoever does not stand by his word. So granted, if you say that giving money affects acquisition of a movable property, it is due to that reason that one who reneges on the transaction after the money is paid stands subject to this curse, right? He who will exact payment, he who exacted payment from the generation of the flood, right? The people who became so wicked that God flooded the earth. Uh, will, God will exact payment from people who don't stand by their word. You do not want to be a person who doesn't stand by his word. Uh, and in this case, it means somebody who says, I will sell it to you for $100. And then he takes the $100. And then he says, you know what? I could sell it to that guy for $150. Take your 100 back. I'm out. That's somebody who's not standing by his word. And, and though the courts can't infor- force him to go through with the deal, God will remember. Right? That's what they're saying. Uh, but the sages said he who exacted payment. But if you say that giving money does not affect acquisition of a movable property, why does one who reneges after the money is paid stand subject to that curse? But the sages said he who exacted payment. And the Gemara answers it is due to the fact that he reneged on a statement of his committing himself to buy the item. And the Gemara asks, and does one renege? And does one who reneged on a statement of commitment? stand subject to the curse but the sages said he who exacted payment but isn't it taught in a barisa and uh, now we're at the top of 48a just going to do a few more lines uh but i'm almost done so questions or comments please get them in rabbi shimon says even though the sages said that when one party takes possession of a garment the other party acquires a gold dinar right in other words when the money changes hands the deal is not done but when the purchaser acquires the item in this case a garment then it's like the, um, the seller has already acquired the money, even if the money hasn't been handed over yet. He has acquired it, even if it's not yet in his possession, it must be given to him, right? Pulling the garment uh, acquires for the seller the money of the other party. Uh, but when one party takes possession of a gold dinar, the other party does not acquire a garment, right? Because changing the money changing hands does not finalize the deal. So in any case... That is what the law would be. But the sages said with regard to one who reneges on a transaction where one party pulled the gold dinar into his possession, he who exacted payment from the people of the generation of the flood and from the people of the generation of the dispersion and from the inhabitants of Sodom and Gomorrah and from the Egyptians in the Red Sea will in the future exact payment from whoever does not stand by his statement. Okay, we got that. We've said it several times. But here the Barisa concludes, and one who negotiates where the negotiation culminates with a statement committing himself to acquire the item, did not acquire the item without a formal act of acquisition. But with regard to one who reneges on his commitment, the sages are displeased with him. In other words, we've said that if, uh, you know, the the seller says, okay, uh, I'll sell you this coat for $100. And the buyer says, okay, here's the $100. And the buyer hasn't taken the coat yet. And the seller took the money, but so he legally can renege on the deal and say, you know what, I, I, I found that I just I can sell this coat for $150. Here, take your 100 back. So this is somebody who's subject to the curse, that the one who extracted payment from the generation of the flood will extract payment from him. What about two people who said, I'll sell you the coat for $100. Okay, I'll buy the coat for $100. And they shake hands on it. But neither the coat nor the money has changed hands. 
Okay, so now does that, in, and then the guy says, oh, you know what? I could sell it for $150. I'm going to walk away. Uh, is he subject to the curse? No. He's not, he's not at the level of immorality of being subject to that curse, but the sages are displeased with him. And if you spent any time on TikTok or Instagram looking at uh, videos of people who buy and sell watches, right, where when they make a deal on an expensive watch, what do they say? They say mazal, right, which is short for mazal ubracha. Uh, and that's just an old formula from the, the gem business, right? The diamond business, the, the precious gem business, uh, where people, when made the deal, they would say mazal, right? When they shake hands on it. Now, money has not changed hands. But in that world, if you shake on a deal to sell a watch or jewelry or whatever, and then you find some other buyer who'll pay you more and you, you know, renege on the deal, so your reputation is destroyed, and you can no longer do business with people in that line of work. So you would never do that. And that's exactly what he, they're saying here. Okay, the curse is not going to be invoked on you, but the sages are displeased with you, you know, and your reputation would be ruined. And Rava says, with regard to one who reneges on his commitment, his verbal commitment, we have only the statement that the sages are displeased with him, but not that he is subject to a curse. And the Gemara explains, if there is a statement of commitment and there is the payment of money accompanying it, he stands subject to the curse. But the sages said he who exacted payment. If there is a statement of commitment, but no money has changed hands, he does not stand subject to the curse, but the sages said he who exacted payment, so we would say the sages are displeased with him. That's what I've got for us today. We'll pick that up tomorrow, God willing, Wednesday, uh, at the special time of this week. Uh, 7.30 p.m. Uh, I got to tell you, uh, I'm very uh, energized by learning with you because uh, I'm exhausted. It's funny, like sound mixing all day on the movie. You know, what am I doing all day? I'm just sitting in a chair, watching the screen, playing, you know, scenes over and over again to get all the sound exactly right. But you have to be so focused right um and just to give an example there's a, in the movie it's a thriller right i've told you about movie guns and moses so there's a scene in the movie where you know somebody gets shot uh and it's a pivotal moment in the movie and just the gunshot right just the gunshot uh itself involves 16 layers of sound right there's 16 components to make that gunshot sound right right i mean there's the there's there's several sounds that combine to make the gunshot sound right there's the reverb there's the riser before there's the resolution after uh there's the ringing out there's a kind of like you know sub subwoofer type of bass that goes with it you know and that and that's just one you know one quarter second moment not even sixth of a second moment uh in the movie and there's 16 layers for that Right? So you can imagine that over an hour and a half movie, and, you know, we're, we're, we're just dealing with hundreds of tracks of sound just to make it sound natural. I mean, all movies are like that and we totally take it for granted. You only notice it when it sounds wrong. But to get it right, you know, just requires this maximum focus. So that's what I've been doing all day. Now, Joseph, car keys could be a good example for a symbolic transaction for selling the deed of a car. Very nice. Very nice. Right. That sounds good. Although it's interesting, that would only work according to Levy, right? Because if you are transferring ownership of the car, you wouldn't take keys in return. You would, send, you would hand the keys over, you know, representing the car, right? But it's the seller would give to the purchaser the keys. So that's actually not what we do. When we would say, you know, a symbolic exchange, it's that the purchaser would have to give the seller some item. You know, uh, and so maybe it would be like a symbolic key, uh, you know, just sort of, you know, symbolizing that we had this exchange. But it has to be something that the buyer is giving to the seller. Michael, Ravi Asimon. So it's like a washer. I thought washer because East Asian coins have a hole in the middle. Very good. Or like slugs, right? They're often called slugs. Right. And I, I'm sure this hasn't happened in decades, but I remember that, you know, right, there were people, you know, back in the 70s uh, who would form these, you know, coins that were the exact size and weight of a quarter. 
you know, that they would put in a pinball machine, right? That's what they called a slug, definitely counterfeit, but that kind of idea. Sharon seems like an Asimon is like a subway token. That was my thought. And it represents the value of a subway entrance, even if the specified fare may change. It has a specific value for a product. Exactly. And Joseph, does all this active acquisition apply to slaves as well? Y- yes. Yes, I believe it does, right? Um, and because Canaanite slaves, and thank God slavery has been abolished, uh, but as it was practiced in the ancient world, slaves were usually subject to the same kinds of laws as guaranteed property, right? As land. So in the, the same ways that land was bought and sold uh, is how slaves would be bought and sold. Uh, and then really, I mean, you know, slave was just so common in the ancient world. What the Torah did is came uh, and gave the slaves, you know, certain rights. I mean, it's still not good to be a slave, uh, but, you know, slaves really just, you know, had no rights whatsoever before the Torah came uh, and gave them some rights. And of course, Hebrew slaves, more rights than Canaanite slaves, uh, because, you know, un- under Jewish law, like for a Jew to become enslaved to another Jew is something that could only happen temporarily until the, the one became enslaved because, you know, he stole and couldn't repay what he stole. Uh, or he became so impoverished that he sold himself into slavery. Uh, But even then, it would only be temporarily. That's what we've got uh, for today. And with God's help, we'll be together again tomorrow, Wednesday, for page 48, here in Tractate Bava Mitzia.